morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Um, thank you for joining us this Sabbath as we sing praises to the Lord and we enjoy this, uh, this high Sabbath that God has given us, this day of rest. Um, we're going to start with song service. And the first hymn that we'll be singing is hymn number 369, Bringing in the Sheaves. Hymn number 369. John, you're going to be preaching on this. Um, Anya has, or the young adults have um, come to a new topic that we're going to be going through this, this year, and it's, good, it's a really good topic, and Pastor John is opening that up for us today. I hear as we're singing, though, I pray that we can remember the time where we were brought in. We heard, we heard testimonies this morning of how we people of Christ have found our faith, how we found Christ. I pray that we can show that on our faces, the joy of our salvation as we're singing. The next song we'll be singing is hymn number 373, Seeking the Lost. Um, and I want to try something. We'll have the left side of me do the, uh, hold on, going afar part. And we'll have the right side doing, going apart. You guys will do the echo of them, okay? Let's see, let's see if we can liven it up, you know? Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much for seeing. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. It's so good to see all of you here. Beautiful, lovely people. Please turn to someone and welcome them. Turn to your neighbor and just give them a, a handshake and embrace and welcome them. Awesome. God is good. God is good. And let me welcome you all to our Anya Sabbath, which stands for Atlanta North Young Adults. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're glad to be here um, singing for you and, you know, performing the entire day for you. So please, we hope you are blessed and you certainly are a blessing to us. We, inv we have a full day of activities. Um, we have a church potluck afterwards and that we invite all young adults uh, and youth to come and anyone that wants to spend the entire day with us. We don't just want you to eat and leave. We want to really get to know you. So we welcome you to that. A couple of announcements. We have the ANC Book Club that is starting tomorrow and will run every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. And we're going to start with um, Reading Ellen White by George R. Knight, how to understand and really apply her writing. So we welcome you all to please sign up for that. And if you want more information, you can speak with Pastor John or myself. Um, next announcement is the Revival Week that's coming up. He is alive from April 6th on to the 13th, and it'll be at 5.30 p.m. So um, this is hosted by our Spanish ministry. Please come out to that week of prayer. The last week of prayer was a blessed one, and I know this one will certainly be uh, an exciting time. If you want to know more information on that, you can speak with someone from the Spanish church. He slips my mind right now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Probably should have written that down. Uh, the next announcement. <laughs> Say it. Oh, yeah, there will be English translations for those of us such as myself who don't speak much Spanish. Uh, next, we have the Stone Mountain Hike and Fun Day. And this is a cross-ministry collaboration between health ministries, men's ministries, and Anya ministry. So we welcome you all to come out to that. That's going to be April 14th. At 10.30, there will be transportation provided uh, by the church. Uh, if you're interested in carpooling, we have a couple buses that will be here. So we invite. It's going to be a great day for the entire family. Please come out. Look forward to that announcement in the church bulletin, and you can sign up and RSVP for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, our next announcement. I was expecting something to play on the screen. Hang on. There we go. Do you have any good scars? And she said, Andrew, I do. Some of them I can show you and some I cannot. The word asylum actually means a place of refuge or sanctuary. Lobotomies or electroshock. They did insulin therapy, ice water therapy. There's the logical part of your brain, which is the frontal lobe, and then there's the emotional part of your brain, which is the limbic system. They lack hope. They feel like others are against them, their illness is against them. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Your amygdala goes, I have to survive. I want comfort. It feels like you have this lead jacket on. You can barely walk. Swimming is actually very therapeutic. You can cry and no one knows. On this side, you have reckless, careless. You get to the other side where we find panic, fear, you freeze. I sit on the edge of my bed for 30 minutes just contemplating what to put on. Who cares? They're closed. One of the amazing things about the human brain is that it is highly plastic. It's very changeable. If you had diabetes, would you take insulin? If you needed glasses, would you wear glasses? Like. You have a chemical imbalance, but your limbic system is in overdrive. Stigma is not biological. Cultural laws are sometimes arbitrary, but they're still binding. And stigma is, is the umbrella. Embarrassment, um, pride, 
I'm macho. Well, is everybody good? And everybody's not good. What we're really talking about is who we are, who we were meant to be. It's just a biological issue. Well, it is, but it's more than that. It's a social issue, it's a relational issue, it's a spiritual issue. Let's just start with the reality. They're not separable. Join me in hundreds of churches around North America as we implement Christ's method and tackle the real prices of mental health. Together, we will mingle with our community, show our sympathy, and meet their needs, which in so doing will reflect the love of Jesus to a dying world. For more information, visit us at mindfitevent.com slash host. So this is for our mental health seminar that's coming up April 4th to 7th at 7 p.m. That's gonna be in the fellowship hall. But very importantly, um, we have a group that's going out into our community today to mingle with them, uh, talk, and hand out flyers. And we are looking for volunteers. It'll be immediately after church. Please sign up to go out into the community. It's a beautiful day. Meet with people, sign, hand out these flyers, um, and you know, contribute in bringing people to Christ, or at least expressing Christ to people so that they have a choice. If you'd like more information on that, please see our brother Shelbert Gaines, he's somewhere here, or any other pastoral staff. And now we'll have our call to worship. Our call to worship is in Psalm 31. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, nor do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Now let us please stand so we can begin our worship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that it's a beautiful day. We thank you that we're all gathered here together to worship you. Lord, I ask that you will send your Holy Spirit now to be with us as we worship together, Lord. Help us to open our hearts to you so that we can receive all the many blessings that you wish to give to us today. We thank you that it's your Sabbath and that we are here together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 289, The Savior is Waiting. Yeah. 
morning, church. I am blessed to be part of today's service, and I'm honored to be um, participating in the tithes and offering this morning. Sorry, you may be seated. <laughs> Um, tithes and offering is a time where we actually all can participate in the service. I remember as a child when um, growing up in the church, um, there, are two, there are a few things I like to participate in, and that was children's story when we were able to pick up the lamb's offering, and then the second was when we did tithes and offering. I remember watching my parents with their tithes envelopes, um, them writing what they need to sit down on their tithes envelope, and I noticed like it was like a thick envelope that they were putting on the offering plate. And then over the years, it got thinner. And I didn't realize until I got older what that meant. Um, so in the beginning, they were giving cash. And so that's why it was thick. And then later on as the years go, they were giving checks. So it got thinner. And then as I grew up and started giving uh, my tithes and offerings, I would do checks sometimes. But the thing I like to do is do electronically on your phone. Um, so I, <laughs> that's easier for me. <laughs> um, even though the way we give may change over the years, um, there's one thing that doesn't change, and that's how we give, and that's with a cheerful heart. Uh, it reminds me of a verse, is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It reads, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So as we remember today, church, let's give today cheerfully. Um, here at Atlanta North, there are many ways that we can give, and it will be on the screen. Um, you can scan that QR code, it'll take you to Adventist Giving. That's how I give. Um, you can text the word give, and you can also do it the old school way with your cash or your check, and there's a box in the foyer, and you can put it in there. Um, and if you would like to, um, if you would like to um, help the Anya um, ministry on your envelopes or on the app, you can um, donate there as well to help further their ministry. Um, today, all loose offering will be uh, for the church local church budget. Let's remember to give back to God what is His and doing it cheerfully. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day. Thank you for the means for us to give and to give cheerfully. Please bless all these offerings and these um, tithes and help it to further your word and your, and your kingdom. Thank you and help us to have a wonderful Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There are, sorry, there are a lot of things that we go through in life. It's just, it's just a fact. Um, <clears throat> it can be good things, it can be bad things, it can be frustrating things, and it can be enriching things, things that can grow you. Throughout it all, we have two Two alwayses, if that makes sense. We have God and we have a church family. We know for a fact that someone, whether it be our family, whether it be our friends, they're going to be by our side and they're going to be praying for us. We know that we have a God who always stays the same, who will always be by our side, and who asks us to come to him because he cares for us. Cast all our anxieties upon him because he cares for me. The song we'll be singing for the first anthem is Take It to the Lord in Prayer. Um, and I pray that you guys can meditate on these words. And as we go about our days, as we strive to follow the theme of uh, this new Anya topic, and as we go about just, yeah, our days, I pray that we can remember somebody's praying for us and remember whatever may happen to us we can take it to the Lord in prayer.
We'll be having our children's story by Prudence Donald. Oh, also the children will be coming up collecting some dolares and uh, for the lamb's offering. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a story about trust and obedience. And once upon a time, there was a little boy called Daniel. Yes, Daniel. Now, Daniel, when he was still a little boy, he moved to Babylon. To Babylon, yes. And yes. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> as Daniel was growing up in Babylon, he was very obedient to his parents. He was obedient to God. He prayed three times a day. And he was very trustworthy too. And as he grew up in Babylon, he grew up to become a very honorable man. And the king was very pleased with Daniel. And because Daniel was already so grown up, he could start working, the king decided to appoint him over all the other provinces in that particular country of Babylon. Now, Babylon wasn't really like Israel, where they all worshipped the same God. But Daniel was very trustworthy to God, and he was very obedient to God that he kept praying to his God even when all his friends didn't pray to God because he was faithful. Now, because the king really loved Daniel and Daniel was really trustworthy, all the other officials wanted to bring accusations to the king to make the king hate Daniel. And they told the king, you should make a law that in the next 30 days, nobody should worship any other god other than you. And have it written down so that nobody would be able to disobey you. And because the king thought this was actually some wise counsel, 
he decided to pass the law. And then Daniel kept praying, and Daniel kept being trustworthy and obedient and faithful to God. And then one day, the officials came to the king and told the king, do you remember the law that you passed? That nobody should worship any other god other than you, the king? The king said, yes, I do remember. And then they said, well, somebody has disobeyed you. Somebody has been worshiping somebody else. And he said, who did? And guess who they said? Daniel. And Daniel used to pray three times a day. And he used to go to an upper room. And he would pray. And all these officials decided to go to the king and report him. And the king loved Daniel so much that he wanted to save him. But the law is the law. And the punishment for anyone who would disobey the law was to be thrown into a lion's den. Can you imagine spending a time in a lion's den? Let me show you a lion's den and what it looks like. Yeah. That's not the lion's den. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the lion's den. Look at the picture of all those lions and then being thrown in there. Can you imagine surviving in there with all those lions looking at you like your food? Lions do not eat grass. Lions eat meat. And you are full of meat. So they would eat you alive. Like so fast. Definitely. They would swallow you alive. You wouldn't even have to breathe twice. The minute you're thrown in there, you disappear. We forget about you. Do you think Daniel was scared or not? No. He was yeah. And he trusted God. And because the king could not save Daniel, he told him very few words. He said, may the God that you faithfully serve save you. And that's all he could do. And then they took Daniel into the lion's den, and they even pulled a stone in front of the lion's den so that he would not be able to escape. And then the king went back to his chambers, and he couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He was so much in distress because his friend Daniel was going to die. And then at dawn, the king ran to the lion's den and asked Daniel, did the living God that you serve save you? He wasn't expecting for an answer because he said, well, Daniel is long gone. But then guess who answered? It was Daniel. Daniel said, yes, my God sent an angel and he shut the mouth of the lion and so they couldn't eat me. And the king was so happy. And you can see that Daniel trusted that God was going to save him. And God did save him. You should learn that God protects the, those who obey him. And if you faithfully trust in God, he will show up. So if you're in school and then you can't do something, you can't understand what the teacher is saying, try to call God. Ask God, please help me, teach me, instruct me. And if you trust that God is going to help you understand, you will be able to understand. Now, another thing why I actually put those pictures up is about the word in Isaiah that says, when Jesus Christ comes back, we will be able to see through the lions. You see how he was scared of Daniel being in the lion's den? When Jesus Christ comes back, we will be able to just chill. Chill with the lion, chill with all these other animals and pet them and be friends with them without being scared of them eating us back. Do you want to experience that? So today you should learn, you should be obeying your parents, you should obey your teachers, you should be trustworthy, and trust in the Lord always. Okay, so who is going to pray for us? Hmm. Okay. Dear God, thank you for this day. Please help everybody to have a good day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much, Prudence, for that message and the children's story. We serve an amazing God. Amen? Just, just amazing, a gracious and amazing God. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms 3 as I read Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we sing, please meditate on the words in Psalms 23 and Psalms 3.
When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I, I have just bought a field and must ins inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, Another said, I have just bought five pairs of, of oxen, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just got married, so I can't come. May the Lord bless the hearers and doers of his holy word. Happy Sabbath, church. Amen. Have you been blessed? Amen. Amen. I can't say enough thank you for everyone that's participated up to this point. And now I would invite the congregation to participate with us in prayer. Before we do that, does anyone have any special requests? If you could signal by just raising your hand, and we'll take it to the Lord, as the song said, and take it to the Lord in prayer. If you could please join me by kneeling as far as you can, as able, and I will just kneel here on the platform. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for at this time we come before you on bended knee, humble and contrite before you, Lord. We pray that this offering of worship might be acceptable in your sight. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us, um, purify our hearts, purify our minds, that we might desire that which you would want for us, that our appetite might be such that we make us hungry for that which what is holy. Lord, you know the burdens of each and every one's hearts that are here present. You know the different things that burden us. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us the courage to hand them over to you. Sometimes it's not that you don't want to bless, but it's that we don't let you. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to surrender so that we might be able to say, as the scripture reading said, yes, Lord, I will come to the feast Nothing else matters. No other responsibility, nothing else will distract me from coming to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to keep this in ever before our minds each and every day. Lord, as we continue in worship, I pray that you might be with us. May your spirit abide. Remove anything, Lord, that would distract. And at this time, Lord, I want to give just a few moments for silent prayer.
As we continue in our worship, Lord, please be with Pastor John. Anoint him from on high, that he would speak that which you would have prepared for him, nothing more, nothing less, that the people might hear the message that you would have them to hear for the purpose of edifying the church and the body of Christ. Thank you for your love, your care, and the privilege to serve in this capacity. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Sabbath. Thank you all so much, Anya, for blessing us. I, I was singing, and I was like, wow, I'm going to get up here and my voice is going to be gone because I'm going to sing so loud. It was such a blessing. Praise God. I um, just want to say a quick word of thank you to the Anya Council team. It's an honor for me to uh, give the word for this Anya Sabbath. Thank you so much. The Anya Council, they, they met and they were talking about what this year's theme should be for Anya Sabbaths. There are going to be four Anya Sabbaths. This is the first one. And they decided to make it on evangelism. Evangelism. In their Bible studies at Friday at 7 p.m., they have been going over the Christ Object Lessons, beautiful book by Ellen White. And there's a specific story in there, chapter 18, that she goes over. Oh, this is the time I get to use the clicker. There's a chapter 18 in there. It's entitled, Go into the Highways and the Hedges. And it is based off of the parable that Glory read. Thank you so much for reading the parable. There we go. That was one too many. Okay. And so, this is what we're going to be covering in the Anya Sabbath. Today we're going to look at the first group of people that were called, invited. These people are the lame excusers, the Jewish leaders and teachers of the people. The second group, we see those are called from the streets and lanes of the city, the poor and lowly in Judea. That is what they represent. The third group are called those who are in the highways. This is represented by the Gentile leaders and teachers of the people. And the fourth group is the hedges and byways, Gentiles who were poor and lowly on the earth. And so today we're going to cover the first group, those lame excuses. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer before we begin. Dearly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you so much for using us as your evangelistic tools. Help us in this year during the Anya Sabbath to be taught and to learn how we can become more effective to be used by you to listen to your calling and to do what you ask us to. We love you, we thank you, and your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and turn. Glory read it so well. Let's go ahead and read the rest because I realized I only put the portion that we're going to be covering. Let's read the full parable. Let's turn to Luke chapter 14 and verse 12 to 24. Luke 14, verse 12 to 24. Oh, not 12, 24. I was reading the wrong slide. Um, Yeah. Well, the parable starts in a different place. I think I copied that down wrong. Starting in verse 16, 16 to 24. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a what? What did he just buy? A piece of ground, a field. I just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Verse 19. And another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. So what? He can't come. (laughs) Verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets. And alleys of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. 
Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will taste of my banquet. Taste of my banquet. We need to understand the context of why Jesus is sharing this parable in the first place before we start to understand what the parable really is trying to communicate to us. So we're going to start with the first question. And this is, we're going to look at the wider context. What prompted Jesus to share the parable? Let's go now to verse 7 to 14 and just quickly look at it. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. And then he tells them, don't pick the high places. Be okay to associate with the low place and let someone else put you there. So th- there's a problem going on here. Pride. The Pharisees, they're seeking the best places. They thought that it was due them, so they're going to take it. Don't, don't do that. The following verses, what we get. Then Jesus said to the host in verse 12, When you give a lunch or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters or relatives, or your rich neighbors, for that matter. If you do, they're going to invite you back. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to do this, and you're going to give back, and I'm not really going to do it for people who can't. This year's theme is evangelism. You see, the pride mixed with greed, the pharisaical pride mixed with greed was stopping them from doing what God wanted to do in the first place. They were only inviting other Pharisees of status. The question is, how can the message of the Messiah go to the world if all you're doing is inviting other like-minded Pharisees? The pharisaical pride stopped them from associating with those they deemed of lower status than themselves. (laughs) People who don't dress like me, act like me, they don't believe the same as me. Those type of people, they don't deserve to come and be associated with me. We're getting this wider context. What prompted Jesus to share the parable in the first place? Ellen White and Christ Object Lessons. There are going to be many slides from Christ Object Lessons, hence the the slides today. She says this, These gatherings, the sacred feasts, the same one that Jesus has been invited to by a rich Pharisee, these sacred feasts were to be used as object lessons to Israel. Being thus taught the joy of true hospitality, the people were throughout the year to care for who? The bereaved and the poor. And these feasts had a wider lesson. A spiritual blessing given to Israel was not for themselves alone. God had given the bread of life to them that they might break it to the world. What is one of the ways that the Jews were meant to evangelize? Inviting people in. Come, let me be associated with you. Here's a religious feast that I can invite you to and I'm going to share the blessings that God has shared with me. But what was the Jewish nation doing? Remember, they're the first group, the leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of law. In the parable, this is the first group. What's happening to them? They're stuck to themselves. They're stuck to themselves. They don't associate with those who aren't Jews. So how can the message, how can the gospel spread? So that's point number one, this wider context. To understand why Jesus talks or gives us the parable, we need to understand this first point, the wider context. The Jews were meant to be a light to the nation, but they can't do this by sticking to themselves, nor especially by being disconnected from the light. And this now leads us into the more immediate context of why Jesus gave us this parable. Look at verse 15. Now we're getting very specific. Verse 15 is interesting because this is in direct reply. The parable is in direct reply to what this Pharisee says in verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, cursed is the one. No. Blessed. Good job. Thank you. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Hmm. Ellen White has a thought on this one. This man spoke with great assurance, as if he himself were certain of a place in the kingdom. Now, is assurance a bad thing? No. You should have assurance, because Jesus died on the cross, and he is right now interceding for you, and it's his blood that pays for your penalty, 
you can have assurance. But what's the problem here? His attitude, continuing the passage, his attitude was similar to the attitudes of those who rejoice that they are saved by Christ, good, but comma, notice the ending clause, when they do not comply with the conditions upon which salvation is promised. The Pharisee, he, he's taking the Messiah's new kingdom for granted. Oh, yeah, when the Messiah comes, bless us with people who do that. Yep, I'll be there. Don't worry about it. I'm a Jew, so I'm going to try and sit in the seat of honor at that banquet, the Messianic feast, this idea in Jewish culture about the Messiah coming. But we understand that salvation is only by Jesus and not by our status. Ellen White continues, Christ read the heart of the pretender and fastening his eyes upon him, he opened before the company the character and value of the present privileges that they had. He showed them that they had a part to act that very time in order to share in the blessedness of the future. He seems to be religious, but he's a pretender. He has a part to play. At this very time, the Messiah is standing right in front of him, and he has no idea that the kingdom of God is already in his midst. He's saying in the future, yeah, by the sweet by and by, I'm going to have that blessing, that retirement insurance. I'm just going to be going on the beaches in heaven, playing with dolphins. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. I'm a Jew. My status has already determined my seat of honor. He's missing the Messiah right in front of him. Would he accept Jesus as the Messiah? That is at this very time what he is called to do. He's a leader of the Jewish people, and he doesn't recognize the Messiah right in front of him. So we can see here that point two, understanding the parable. We already focused on the wider context to help us understand what the parable is trying to teach us. Now the immediate context. Jews are not saved by their being a Jew. They are saved by being connected to the Messiah. Let me hear an amen. Amen. Let's quickly cover a little bit more of the following context, kind of flesh this second point out. Right after the parable of the banquet feast, you see right up there at the bold section, verses 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 25 to 32, Jesus covers what? You have to count the cost of discipleship. Then he talks about hating family. Well, this understanding what Jesus is truly meaning, he's saying that you need to put him above all other relationships. Then he talks about bearing the cross. You can't go back to your old way of life. The new kingdom has already arrived, and you can be a part of it. Don't go back. Keep watch, if you remember the last two sermons. Building a tower. Can you truly afford to follow Jesus? You need to count the cost of discipleship. A king in war. And you can look at these. We're not going through them for sake of time. A king in war. Can you afford to refuse? The call. Let's go to verse 33. 33 kind of summarizes everything very nicely. Chapter 14, verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, what? You cannot be my disciple. What matters in this life is not your earthly stuff. Now, let's unpack the parable. Let's go to the call. Call. Luke 14, 16. A call goes out, and people are asked to come to the wedding feast. They're called to come, basically, if you would, the messianic table. In verse 15, the Pharisee says, blessed is whenever, whenever we can eat bread at that table. He's referring to the messianic table, referring to the kingdom to come, that when the Messiah comes here, everything will be great, and you'll be able to eat there. Jesus kind of matches that by sharing a parable of a big banquet feast. You're excited about the messianic feast, the messianic table? Here it is. Here it is. Anyone would be exceedingly foolish to reject this. The problem that we see in these rejections, as we continue moving through the verses, is that the people who declined, this first group, had a problem with weighing values in life. All right. Let's move on to rejection number one. That's the second one. The field. Rejection number one. Hey, come to the 
come to the banquet. That's okay, I just bought a field and I have to go look at it. This is ridiculous. If you're anyone standing or sitting and listening to Jesus share this parable, it makes absolutely no sense. No sense at all. You wouldn't buy a field and not examine it first. So why now are you needing to examine it? <laughs> it's nonsensical. The second nonsensical reason, it'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. It'll be there tomorrow. What about the second one? The oxen. I have five yoke of oxen. I need to go look at them first. Anytime you see number five, you need to look at the context because the context will help drive the um, interpretation of number five. Not always will number five mean this, but in this context, brevity. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It's a handful. You just grasp it and you let it go. Five yoke of oxen. It's, it's not that big of a deal. No one buys oxen without testing them first. Oh, I need to go test my oxen. Again, completely nonsensical, just like the field. They're going to be there tomorrow. Something else is first in his life. Rejection number three. This one is truly bizarre. <laughs> the wife. I mean, this one probably might make a little sense to anyone in the Jewish context. Sure, if you have a wife, there is this law that you can kind of twist if you want, that once someone is married, a young man is married, he's allowed to stay home away from military service to please his wife and hopefully produce an offspring. Because if he got killed, what's going to happen to her? She needs that insurance for her own life. The Old Testament Levitical law did a lot for the ancient culture where women were really, you know, put down. I'm not going to get into that rabbit hole. You can kind of twist it if you want, saying, okay, yeah, he has a wife. Sure, that's not really a good enough reason not to go to this banquet. You see, he could have brought her. <laughs> He's withholding from her a nice banquet. <laughs> I mean, if I did that to Carolyn, like, Carolyn, I love you so much that I got invited to like the super fancy banquet at one of the top towers in Midtown. But I decided to not go and not bring you with me because we're just going to stay at home and eat my cooking. <laughs> and Carolyn says, yes, I love it, your cooking. <laughs> it's better than anything else. Thank you, I appreciate that. He could have brought her. <laughs> he says he can't come. Notice this is the only excuse where there is no excuse. He doesn't say, please have me excused. And the Greek word for have me excused, that's the only word for excused. It literally, it's never used except for declining an invitation. And this one, he doesn't say it. His heart's in another place. I mean, come on, what's, what's happening here? So the, the question, the big question that we need to ask, why don't they come? Friends, something else has priority in their lives. They are being called, called into the Messianic feast. The Jewish nation is called to share in these blessings, to come and eat the bread of life so that they can share it. But what are they doing? They're distracted. They're not keeping watch over their own heart. We see that they were only willing to listen to the invitation when it was convenient for them. And we're unwilling to put the feast first. In the ancient context of an invitation, they didn't have the best way of timekeeping. Yes, they had sundials, they had all that different type of stuff, but they also didn't have quick ways to make meals. They don't have a timer in the oven and say, okay, the lasagna is going to go in for 90 minutes and then it's going to be done. So, hey, go ahead and come in 90 minutes. No, a feast this big, oh, it took a big process. It was laborious trying to Make sure everything was done on time. So what would happen is you would send your servants and they would go knock on your guest door and they would say, there's going to be a feast. Oh, great. I will come and get you when it's ready. Okay, I'll just stay home and I'll, I'll wait for your call. That's kind of what happens in the book of Esther. Is She tells um, the king, hey, I'm going to have a feast for you. The servants go, tell him, they come back, they prepare the, the meal, and then the servants go back and escort everyone in. Haman is kind of caught off guard talking about how he's going to, you know, lift himself up, and he's like, oh, the servants are here, I gotta go. So that, that was kind of what they did. Instead of texting, hey, it's ready, they would send their servants back a second time. So we can see here that first 
when the call goes out, it sounds great. It sounds marvelous. Yes, I want to eat bread in the new kingdom. And they accept, yes, I'll be ready for it. But then when they are called to action, to actually leave what they're doing at the present moment, it's not convenient for me. Nah, I'm sorry, I have something more important to do. Friends, you prioritize the things you deem important. Prioritize the things you deem important. Ellen White says this, The Pharisee was not thinking of his own fitness for heaven, but what he hoped to enjoy in heaven. When it's hearing about all those great things, by the sweet by and by, yes, I'm in, I'm sold. Eternal life, give me that fountain of youth, I'll take it, yes, please. But when it comes down to putting Christ first, coming to him, the Pharisee got hesitant. It isn't convenient anymore to actually act on the invitation. Please have me excused. This isn't what I was expecting. I have some unrealistic expectations on how things should go, and I would rather that those be met. <laughs> we need a reality check. God needs to give us the true expectations in life. You see, th this is the list of, of the excuses that were made if you boil it down to the principle. The three excuses. One, property, the field. That's his property. Two, occupation, my oxen. That was probably his trade. He's buying and selling oxen. Or they're used to plow his field. I think that's, that's the real one. Um, number three, family. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at this list, are those things important? Yeah, <laughs> those things are very important in life. You need property in order to take care of your family. You need your occupation in order to take care of your family. You need your family so that you can take care of your family. But from a divine perspective, the excuses are ridiculous. When you look at that list, you think, I know many things in my life that I need to take care of that fall under those three things. But Jesus, through this parable, does something cool where he opens up our eyes, and when you read the excuses, go check out a field, that's ridiculous. It's there tomorrow. I mean, you probably checked it before you bought it anyways. That's what is happening in our lives. The Jewish leaders refused. Ellen White says this, the invitation to the feast was first given to the Jewish people, the people who had been called to stand as teachers and leaders among men, the people in whose hands were the prophetic scrolls for telling Christ's advent, and to whom was committed in the symbolic, uh, the symbolic service foreshadowing his mission, the sanctuary. Had priests and people heeded the call, they would have united with Christ's messengers in giving the gospel invitation to the world. This year's theme for Anya Sabbath is evangelism. These people were called to evangelism. These people were called into a personal connection with Christ. Imagine what would have happened if, if the Jewish leaders would have accepted and united with the Messiah, the Christ. They were the guardians of God's word, the sanctuary message, the Sabbath, the prophetic word. Imagine if there were 50 Pauls instead of one. Imagine if there were a hundred Pauls instead of one. They rejected the call. God with us. That's not supposed to happen, that they reject the call. So dear friends, what about us today? Imagine what would happen if we, if you, would truly be united with Christ. Christ. Guardians of God's word, the Adventists, we have the sanctuary message, the Sabbath, the prophetic word. Imagine what would happen if we had 50 Mark Finleys or 100. What's special about Mark Finley? He's connected with Christ. He doesn't let his status or image get in the way. He is going to listen to God's call first. Do we sometimes hide behind the thought that because we have the truth, we're guaranteed a place in the table, the glorified kingdom, the marriage supper of Revelation 19. I'm an Adventist, I'll be there. Let's analyze the wider context now with that in view. SDAs, Seventh-day Adventists, are meant to be the light to the nations, but they can't do this by sticking to themselves, nor especially 
by being disconnected from the light. Who are you inviting to your home, your inner family circle? Are you only inviting those who can repay you back? Only those who look, think, and believe like you? We should not give into pride that we have arrived. Because without keeping watch, we might in fact miss the point. <laughs> I love my dad. He, he says this uh, in a rather funny way. I think it's funny. I love him. Anytime he messes up or does something wrong, he's like, ah, I missed the point. I missed the point. Are we keeping watch? Are you keeping watch? Is your loyalty to God alone? Are you keeping watch? Loyalty is not lip service alone. We have an evangelistic effort to be had, but all of this can't be accomplished if we miss the call to be fully united with Christ. The media context, Seventh-day Adventists are not saved by their being Seventh-day Adventists. They are saved by being connected to who? The Messiah. Friends, today we need to value or, or look over the values in our life and count the cost. Notice that with the Jewish nation, they didn't accept, at least the leaders, leaders didn't accept. And chapter 15, the continuing context, God calls someone else. If you're not willing to answer the call, He will ask someone else to come. So, dear friend, you really need to take to heart this idea of counting the cost of discipleship. Can you afford to be a disciple of Christ? Can you afford not to be? Are you ready to renounce all possessions to follow Christ to the one who loves you the most? Or are you saving your love for something that doesn't last? The question that we need to answer today is how can we be fully united with Christ? And we're going to do so by analyzing the parable. Why didn't people answer the call? They weren't putting God first in their life. Surrender is putting God first in your life. We can see that those called made lame excuses. They were putting something before God in their lives. And they weren't going to be connected. Surrender, it can be a difficult concept. But really, it's not that hard if you just sit down and think about it. Many of us, we hear a pastor say, yes, you need to surrender. Yes, you need to be loyal to God. But then we go home and we don't think about it. What does that mean for your life? Pen and paper in hand, are you counting the cost of being a disciple? Are you analyzing if you have enough to complete the tower? You do. We understand that we're empowered by God. Surrender is putting God first in your life. Surrender also isn't doing something only when it's convenient to you. <laughs> Flip-flopping around. That's not surrender. A general who's captured by an opposing army that overpowered him, do you think that he can look at them and say, I, excuse me, I don't really want to be surrendered at this moment. I, I'm going to go. Maybe I'll come back in a couple days. Is that okay with you? <laughs> no! What kind of surrender is that? You can't jump in and out of it. Where is your priority in life? Many of us flip-flopping around. Surrender is recognizing you need to ask and rely on His power because you've surrendered and your power is inadequate. Surrender is recognizing that now you're not living on your own power. You have to live by someone else's power. If a general is captured by the opposing army, does he now command his soldiers to go do this and that? Hey, bring me my lunch, bring me my dinner. Oh, that supply chain that I meticulously organized before we did this battle? Yeah, we're going to use that? No. He now has to rely on the one who captured him, who overpowered him to give him food, to give him water, to direct him where to go. Surrender is truly an easy concept. It, it, we just don't think about it. Because we're not analyzing the cost. Dear friend, analyze the cost of discipleship. With God, all things are possible. He can help us to choose better. Ellen White in Steps to Christ talks about this idea of giving up your power of choice. 
That is surrender. You're not going to do what you want to do because you're depraved and and sin has messed you up. You can't really analyze what's truly valuable in life. You have to go to the source who created you to understand what's valuable, to receive from him power to do what he wants you to, and that will give you a fulfilled life. So, as we continue, a quick self-diagnostic. This is really simple. This is a good starting point because surrender can be... um, uh, well, it's the work of a lifetime, if I'm being honest. We have daily. It's a, it, surrender is a daily choice. Daily choice to give up your power of choice to the one who loves you and knows you the best. So here's what you can do. Something really simple that you can start out with. Whatever you do first thing in the morning and right before bed is an easy indication to what you are putting first in your life. It's, re- it's really simple. Now, the next step from this is that you're guarding to see if your time is prioritized over what you put first. Not just a quick devotion so that you can get through devotion really quickly and get to the other priorities that you have in the day. See, your priorities lie elsewhere. I'm just going to go quick. I'm just going to read a short devotional and I'm out the door. At least I did it. That's relying upon your status as a Christian in order to be with God. Do you truly love being with God? I mean, that's, that's a question. All right, let's quickly analyze this, and it'll become more self-explanatory. Property, the first, or not the first, one of the excuses given. Surrender is putting God first regardless or not if it's for convenient for you or not. Are you on your phone all night researching something that you want to purchase? That's something, property. That's the last thing you're doing throughout the day. Are you rushing through your morning devotion so that you can get back to researching. Eh, oh, John, I, I don't spend all that much time on my phone right before bed. I, I, I read some from the Bible. Or when I wake up, I'm going to open the Bible. I'm going to read some word. But then your mind is somewhere else. Your mind is still thinking about what you want to do with your property later on in the day. In a family household, there are two types of washing machines. The first one does laundry, and the second one, your brain. Brain washing. Are you having your morning devotional so you can quickly get back to that? Oh, I need to see what's on Wheel of Fortune. I don't know. (laughs) That's the best I could think of on the spot. (laughs) What about in the evening? Is that the thing that you do right before you have devotionals? In my baptismal study with some of the high schoolers in the church, we were talking about this, how we can have effective Bible reading. And I asked them the question, How easy is it to read the Bible after you watch a movie? Now, what do you think they said? No, it's not easy. It's rather difficult. For that matter, is it easy to read any book after you watch a movie? No. (laughs) Is it easy to eat your broccoli after you had a big tub of ice cream? Is the big tub of ice cream healthy for you? How meaningful is your devotion? Is it your priority? Because you're going to align your day based off of what you put first in your life. I'm going to have my devotions first. Because if I watch a movie before that, if I do anything before that that might distract me from it, ooh, it's a lot tougher to go deep and meaningful in my devotion. I'm calling you, I'm asking you, and wherever you are in your relationship with Christ, to put Him first. Don't try um, to give up things without him. Put him first and your love for him will grow and you naturally will let go of the things that are hindering you from excelling and having a blessed life. Occupation. Is that work email the first thing you check in the morning? Or while you're having your devotion? Is it just kind of in the back of your mind, that anxiety, I need to hurry up my devotions because I'm going to have a meeting in five minutes. So I need to get out the door. Do you pray for God to help you in your work? Is he constantly there with you? Or are you just doing it on your own power? Do you trust in your own ability or do you trust God? Moving right along. Family. If you truly loved your family, I want you to listen closely. If you truly loved your family, you would know that you need to put God first in order to love them. That's all I need to say. Ellen White says, He, the third excuse... I have a wife, had learned to find pleasure in other society than that of his host. He did not ask to be excused, 
He made not even a pretense in the courtesy of his refusal that I cannot was only a veil for the truth. I do not care. All the excuses betray a what? Preoccupied mind. If you want to put God first in your life, it's not just about, oh, I'm going to do this at the beginning and the end. Now let's move a little step further. How are you arranging your day? What, where does your priority, where do your thoughts lie? That's why the Bible talks so much about meditating on God's Word. Anyways, uh, continuing the passage. To these, and now we're opening up to all the guests that had excuses. They had other interests. Uh, they became all absorbing. The invitation they had pledged themselves to accept was put aside. It's not convenient anymore. And the generous friend was insulted by their indifference. So, dear friends, is your mind preoccupied? Have you counted the cost? Can you afford to refuse? Are you willing to put God first in your life? This is the last slide. I love this. In order to accept the invitation to the gospel feast, in order to accept being united with Christ, they must make their worldly interests subordinate to the one purpose of receiving Christ and his righteousness. God gave how much to man? All. And he asks, how much? He asks him to place his service above every earthly and selfish consideration. He cannot accept a divided heart. Surrender. You can't get in and out of it. It's not this flippy floppy thing. The heart that is absorbed on earthly affections cannot be given up to God. The lesson is for all time. Here is what you need to do. You need to follow the Lamb of God wherever he goes. His guidance is to be chosen. His companionship valued. This, above all other companionships with earthly friends. So, dear friend, in light of this parable, in light of everything that has been said, what are you going to do? The Jewish nation, they were missing that connection with the Messiah. And this year is evangelism Sabbath uh, for Anya, evangelism uh, for Anya Sabbaths. And if you want to be an evangelist for God, you have to put him first in your life. If you want to reach family members, friends, if you have that ache in your heart, you have to put Christ first. Surrender everything to him. See that you can't afford to do anything else. His love outshines all other things. Unite with him. See what great things the Lord will do through you and put God first in your life. Accept the call because he wants to use you. Amen. The closing hymn that we'll be singing is hymn number 309, I Surrender All, and please stand with us.
Hello, church family. Have you been blessed this morning? We praise God. The Anya theme, as has been stated today, for the year is witnessing. And for our Anya Sabbath, we'll be focusing on this parable, talking about the different groups that, um, that have been called to the great banquet. And today, you have been called as that first group. The question is, have you heard it? Have you heard the call? And will you accept it? Every day, the Savior is waiting to enter into our hearts. Let us pray today that we are willing to surrender to accept that call. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of the banquet, for the bread of life that you have served, for each and every one of us to accept. Father, I pray that you would be able to help us to value it above everything else in our lives, that we would put it first, and that as we seek you first, that all these other things would be added unto us. Father, I pray that you'd be able to be with us as we go into our everyday lives. There are other groups to be called, and we pray that we would be those servants to go and call them. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, you may be seated. Uh, a few post announcements. Sorry. Post announcements, yes. Um, we have a potluck, and everyone is invited. From the byways, from the highways, right? <laughs> what is your excuse? There's no excuse. Um, young adults, youth, every new person, everyone who wants to join in in the Sabbath festivities, please come and join us with, uh, in, in potluck. Uh, we'll be closing, the Anya Choir will be closing out with a postlude. Feel free, to, feel free to listen or make your way to the fellowship hall. Thank you so much.